What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Lights Out Podcast. Today, we, we've got a very disturbing case for you. Morgan Geyser and Anissa Wire, and this character called Slenderman. Slenderman's lore might date back to medieval Germany. Slenderman became an internet phenomenon after being entered into an internet Photoshop contest on June 10, 2009. The two Photoshop pictures showed images of children and behind them, a tall, thin, spectral character lurked in the background. The strange creature became known as Slender Man. It's called the Tulpa effect. It's basically this idea that if enough people believe that something is real, it can actually manifest in the real world. They needed to kill their friend, Bella. It was the only way to convince Slender Man that they were loyal to him. He wasn't just a story or a photoshopped image. He was real. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Lights Out Podcast. I'm your host, Josh. I'm joined in the studio by my co-host, Austin. What's hey, up, man? How's it going? Could be better, actually. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I have a quick little story. Sure. So I was just in D.C. last week uh, for the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children's Gala. And I come home, back to the airport. I go to my truck, which I left my truck at the airport garage. And my truck had been broken into. No way. Yeah. And uh, what happened was, is they apparently targeted my truck because it's, you know, trucks are oh, uh, it's awesome. a hot commodity. It's a cool yeah. truck. And uh, turns out it was the cartel. No way. Yeah. Yeah. So the, so obviously I had an officer come over. What they did was they popped off my driver's side handle, literally like pulled it clean off nearly, popped the entire lock out of it, got into the truck, disabled the horn and all of like the security features in it wow and apparently this is a big problem at uh, denver international airport which i thought it was safe inside of a lock uh, you, the lot so yeah, you'd think that'd be the safest place to keep your car no yeah. apparently not and so the cop came over he's like oh yeah you know we've we've had dozens of trucks stolen so what they were actually going to do was steal the entire truck wow so apparently what the cartel does is they they bring an suv in like eight people deep and then the first night they go and they scout out which trucks they want to take and they take pictures of it they go and disable the the security alarms on it and they steal uh the user manuals because ford trucks have a way to like i guess reset the codes on them and then they go and make a fob for it so they can actually start it up and drive it out of the lot. So they have an entire operation. Oh yeah, this he said this is 100% cartel. It's it's organized and they they roll out with 7 8 trucks at a time. Wow. Out of the parking lots. And so luckily I'd gotten back to it before they actually stole the whole thing, but they were planning to steal the entire thing. And they also managed to reset the safe that I have built into my my truck which had my firearm in it Whoa. and they stole my my pistol. So I no have to report way. that is stolen, yeah. So my my pistol is stolen. The security alarms are all completely busted on it. The horn doesn't work. And now I don't even know, like they there's a huge deep gash underneath my my handle where they like I don't know if they like cut it or they pried it off or something, but the lock's gone. So I don't even know what what they're gonna have to do. They're gonna have to replace the whole door or if the handle just has to be replaced. Man, Denver Airport. Get so it be together careful. over there. No, I know. Yeah. And, and I was wow. like, so you guys aren't able to stop this? And like, no, they literally just, they roll in and then they drive all the vehicles right out. They knock down the little arm to the thing and they uh -oh. just drive right out and they're gone. Wow. And they, they change it up. But he's like, what they do is these guys that are hired by the cartel to do this, then get paid out per vehicle. I think he said like my truck was worth 7,500 bucks cash to these guys that steal it. And then they put them on con in containers and send them to Mexico. And then the cartel drives them wow. in Mexico because that's what they roll around in is pickup trucks down there. Well, I was out of town the same time you were. I mean, I'm they're not going to try and steal my Toyota Corolla, I don't think. But I actually, uh, I took the train all the way from where I live. The light rail, really? you know how it goes all the way in there? Because, yeah, I don't, something in the back of my mind tells me I shouldn't be 
parking my car at the lot, but I guess this is why. It's like $30 yeah. a day too. Yeah. So I paid expensive. $30 a day thinking it was safe. I thought there was cameras up there. There's no cameras. Yeah. And so, so yeah, so that was uh, on my birthday too. Oh, help you. <laughs> so that was a nice it's little happy birthday. You know? Yeah. Now, you get, now I got to go uh, get my, my truck fixed and I don't even know how, how, what that's going to be like because the lock's gone so i'm like are you have to replace all the locks on the right. vehicle like yeah. it's gonna be a major pain man well let's try that happen so but otherwise i'm do, i'm doing good i'm i'm happy i'm alive it's just a material thing true it can be fixed at least it wasn't gone had i gone you know been gone another day or two the truck was likely gone is yeah, what the cop said that would have been super sad and well. that would be really shitty because yeah uh on the other side, though, that. you did get to see DC for the first time. That was your first time there. Right? It was my first time there. Yeah, yeah, it was really cool to see see all the monuments and stuff, and went to the the White House and go in the White House. But yeah, I don't think they allow tours in there anymore, no, do they? I don't think. I think you can, but you have to like go through your senator and and oh. it's this whole process. You have to get a background check and like it's yeah. a whole month. I was I was a thing. kid and it was pre nine eleven. And I actually got to do a tour. I think I was like seven years old or something, but I actually got to go inside the White House. Oh, that's house. cool. Yeah. It's a lot smaller than it looks. Yeah, it is. It's like, I mean, it's still a big house, mm -hmm. but it's definitely not like this sprawling palace situation. It's like yeah. very much just like a... I also thought it was kind of goofy in there. It's, it's like, here's the red room and yeah. the green room, and they have all this, I don't know, it's not kitschy, but it's, it's so dated, a lot of the furniture. Well, I don't know. This was circa... 2000 well, every president so. gets to like remodel it I think. oh do they, they like it to at least change out the carpets and the uh drapery and stuff like that they can okay. like, like it was all gold i think when when gotcha. trump was there and then i don't know what biden changed it to but they are able to like kind of renovate it to so how they whoever, want to decorate it whoever it was it was either it had to have been clinton or or bush, bush jr yeah so whoever did it then had really bad <laughs> really taste, bad taste. <laughs> yeah. well yeah anyways daniel how are you doing man I'm doing good, man. Good, good, good. Well, today we, we've got a very um, disturbing case for you. And you've probably heard of it because there's a, there was a documentary done by HBO, fairly well done, called Beware of the Slender Man. Yes, we are going to be covering the Slender Man stabbings and going into that into great detail. There's a lot of discussion with this one because, again, we're dealing with minors in this episode. And so definitely a lot of of controversy around their punishment and kind of really looking at how this all went down and why creepy pasta i mean when i was young i don't know how long creepy pasta has been around but i feel like i probably would have been a fan as a as a youngling if i had free range access to the internet i know by the time i was 16 17 it was pretty big not as big as it got mm -hmm. in the end but i remember there were the days where people would post things and they almost seemed semi-real like it wasn't after a while you just realize these are all completely made up but some of the older creepy pastas genuinely felt like someone's true story from when they were growing up or something and they had these weird experiences but which as a young impressionable child like it's very easy for fantasy to kind of meld with reality yeah and in this case it's exactly what happens but in the worst way possible but before we get into today's episode just a couple things thank you to all of our new members we appreciate you um, if you'd like to join there's a bunch of different perks on on the membership page on youtube it's an exclusive club of low lifes is what we're calling them and uh it's been fun to hang out with you guys in discord um i'm working on getting some wallpapers made for you guys for computer phones which will be cool uh specifically of this this new picture that we're kind of debuting it's been next to austin the last couple of weeks but we thought let's let's switch things up a little bit and so this is now our main centerpiece really really cool and it's us three it's right? us three yeah, yeah yeah so like in the middle is me i've got the backwards hat we got austin with the mullet yeah. and daniel with the beanie and look at we're in character today perfect hey. <laughs> we got the beanie the mullet the hat that, yeah also i haven't mentioned this in a while but i do have a cbd company called higher love and uh, right now we're doing a huge sale on all of our cbd products from 
tincture oils to topicals to waxes, vape cartridges, you name it. If you're looking for a way to chill out that isn't going to get you high or make you feel funny, but just relax you overall, I mean, you can use it throughout the day at work. There's no THC, so you don't have to worry about any of that. Check it out, higherlovewellness.com. Sales from 20 to uh, 50% off on some items. So check that out. We ship all over the place except for Canada, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, that's higherlovewellness.com. With that out of the way, shall we jump in to the Slender Man stabbings? So to start things off, we're going to give you some background on the two teens that are at the center of this case, and that is Morgan Geyser and Anissa Wire. So Morgan Geyser was a surprise baby. She was born May 16, 2002, and she became the light of her mother's world. Even as a toddler, she always marched to the beat of her own drum, and from a young age, she didn't care what others thought of her. This was impressive for a young girl since many kids usually worry about how their friends see them. I know I did. And her mother had supported Morgan's differences. But as time went on, she realized that these differences weren't always positive, and there was something off about her. Morgan didn't react to things the same way that other kids reacted. For example, her mother remembered watching Bambi with Morgan for the first time, and I think we've all seen Bambi. Yep. Honestly, a pretty heartbreaking movie. Yeah. Starts it off pretty rough. Pretty rough. Yeah. Because most young children are scared and sad when Bambi's mother gets shot by the hunter. And as Bambi scrambles to shelter, the crack of a rifle rings out. And in the end, his mother doesn't make it. And most kids bawl their eyes out at this scene. But instead, Morgan just yelled at Bambi to run faster and save himself. And according to her parents, she didn't shed a single tear the entire movie. This was the first sign that maybe something might have been off with Morgan. As she got older, she became obsessed with darker things. As the online world opened up to her in her preteen years, she became obsessed with this creature known as Slenderman, a tall, faceless ghoul that had become a meme on the internet. She was so obsessed that she would show her parents some of the stories and videos online. Her mother wasn't thrilled about her interest, but really didn't see a bigger problem then. It never crossed her mind that Morgan thought that this internet sensation, Slenderman, was actually real. A lot of kids are fascinated with horror characters like Freddy, Jason, or Michael Myers. I mean, I'm sure all of us have had characters that we liked in the horror genre. I loved Michael Myers. That was, Michael Myers that was, was your favorite. Yeah, he terrified me. I loved all the movies when I was a kid, but I wasn't really allowed to watch them, so I kind of had to sneak them when they showed them on AMC late at night. Yeah, Chucky was. Uh, oh yeah, was Child's one of my favorites. Play. I don't nice. know why. That's I've always classic. just had this fascination with dolls, hence why I have yeah. Annabelle in here now. Yeah, I just there's something about it that's always creeped me out, and then obviously it was. Oh, when Pennywise. I read that book for the first time as a, as a kid, I was like, oh, terrified of, yeah. of clowns for a while. But at first, and as a parent, it's just your kid enjoying things, right? Like, there's no, it's not necessarily reason to raise an alarm and be like, oh, my kid's going to do what these characters do or is going to go down this dark road as a result of consuming this kind of content. So Morgan's parents really didn't see a problem with it. They kind of equated it to kids believing in Santa Claus, right? Except this is a darker character, of course. But it's this whole idea of like belief in something. And that's kind of a controversial issue. Is it good for kids to believe in things? Like even Santa Claus or the Easter Bunny or the Tooth Fairy? I think because so. does that lend to them also believing into characters or ideas that maybe don't have... Uh, you know, light and fluffy outcome to them or something that they're associated with. I think for most kids, it just sparks the imagination right, a little bit. Right. And after a certain point, you realize that, no, like Santa Claus isn't real. So I don't know. I was pretty young when I, it's always like an older sibling who, who drops that bomb, but I don't think it's damaging in any way to believe in Santa Claus. I think it's more just fun and yeah. Well, it's like all kids fun. do it. Yeah. We all have imaginations. So it's like, so you're going to rob your kid of having an imagination by not allowing them to believe in any sort of fantasy. Like, right. I mean, I've, 
I'm sure I've said this a million times on the show, but I was absolutely and still am consumed by Tolkien's universe and yeah. the Lord of the Rings. And just, I found that at a young age, like 10 years old and fell in love with it. And Same. I can't even put my finger on what it is exactly that I love so much about it. I mean, there's, it's kind of all encompassing, but through games and media and books, absolutely consumed by that universe to this day. I mean, I'm tattooed with, with this on me and yeah. I'm sure you, both of you guys have examples of something like that, like a fandom that you have that you're kind of consumed with and whether it be, you know, good in the eyes of, you know, is it moral, is it ethical or not? But like, was there something that you, uh, later in early in life, Lord of the Rings was definitely, I still spin the extended edition oh, yeah. rays every, like once every few years. Um, and then later I really got into Dune, the Dune series. Uh, so I would say those two, those are, I mean, it's kind of a cop out cause those like, those are like the two big, when you think of like fantasy and sci-fi, know, right? those are like the two top dogs. But really, I mean, I think it's because the world building was so interesting and so good. It did feel real to some extent. It's an immersion it was, factor to it. Yeah. Cause I think it's one thing to believe in a specific character, but then to believe in a whole universe is a whole other thing. Yeah. And I think what maybe why we're drawn to those is that Tolkien, I think to some extent and Frank Herbert who wrote the Dune series, they really locked themselves away in their study rooms and dove really Very deep. deep into those universes and I think that's maybe why we can dive so deep into them as well as because the creators did. So that's I think good, there's some power there. I like that. What about you, Daniel? I know you have a few. I mean, I'm a huge Star Wars fan. Yes. Uh, like you, my entire right arm is all tattooed with Star Wars stuff. So Star Wars was my my big thing. And I think it's because it was a it was the fandom that my dad and I kind of got into when I was younger. And yeah, I've just been a fan ever since. And I know not all of not, not not everything that Star Wars has put out in the past 10 years has been great, but I still love it just out of nostalgia. Totally. Well, and it's even with any of these stories we just mentioned, there's it's good versus evil is the theme, right? Yeah. And as a fan of these universes, I was a fan of the evil characters in it as well. Like I love the Nazgul. I love, I mean, a huge fan of Sauron, maybe not what he did to middle <laughs> earth, but, but just the, the dark aspects of it. So I don't think it's, out of the ordinary for a kid to be a fan of something darker you know what i mean it's just yeah. kind of like sometimes you're naturally drawn to it i mean we we have conscience of good bad and i think as a kid as you're growing up you kind of lean into both of those at different times yeah and so you kind of you're, you're just exploring in life and you're just kind of feeling out how you go about making decisions and you're learning about morals and ethics and and so having both those types of stories with good and evil it allows you to kind of lean into both sides of your your conscience in a way i don't know if if that's accurate at all but that's just kind of the way that yeah that i and kind of felt dune was way more approachable when i was older too because it touches on the the hero's journey and how the trope yeah. of a hero's journey and how like it's not always this easy route and sometimes what we see as a hero doesn't really turn out to be a hero in the end and i always I love that concept, which I don't think I really could have grasped too, too much when I was younger, but that's why, yeah, there's kind of those ideas of what is right and wrong, kind of those moralistic lenses that we can see those works through and they're it, powerful. Yeah, it is. And like media shouldn't be the only thing that's giving you that information as a child. Obviously your parents play the largest role in teaching you right from wrong. For and, sure and guiding you in the right way and if they see you start you know kind of only going down one path and you're never coming back to the other side then as a parent that should be a cause for concern in my opinion of like okay she's only going down this road i haven't seen her come back to this side in a while and it sounds like from an early age morgan was just kind of gravitated to to the darkness in a sense and that's something that we can talk about more more later on maybe why that is and is there other underlying factors to that today's episode is sponsored by acorns acorns helps you and your kids save and invest and the best part there's no expertise required 
Investments are automatically put into diversified portfolios based on your risk tolerance. Acorns even has exclusive financial education content for your whole family. As a parent, I basically have negative time in my day. I always knew investing for me and my kids was important, but I do not have the time to manage a portfolio or the money to pay someone to do it for me. That's why I have been loving Acorns. It's easy to get started and I just set my contributions to deposit automatically on a monthly basis. It's been fun to see the potential growth over time. The sooner you start investing, the more chance your money has to grow over time. From Acorns, Mighty Oaks do grow. Head to acorns.com slash lights out to download Acorns to start saving and investing for your future today. I'm a big fan of Acorns and I'm sure you will too. It's very easy to get started, easy to learn, and it's fun to watch your money grow over time. Pay testimonial and may not be representative of all clients. Compensation provides an incentive to positively promote Acorns. View important disclosures at acorns.com slash lights out. Investment advisory services offered by Acorns Advisors, LLC, an SEC registered investment advisor. Brokerage services provided by Acorns Securities, LLC, an SEC registered broker dealer and member FINRA SIPC. For more information, visit acorns.com. As for Morgan's friend, Anissa Wire, she was born on October 10, 2001. She grew up with an interest in singing and later joined the school choir. This was one of her biggest hobbies in school and one of the ways that she got out of the house and socialized with other kids. When she was home, her parents could hear her practicing her vocal lessons in her room, and occasionally she had to FaceTime on her iPad with other students in the choir. But her dad would pop his head in the room to ask who she was talking to and what they were working on, and most days she had a hard cutoff at 7.30 p.m. They would make her turn the iPad off and spend time with the family downstairs. But other days, she would spend hours and hours on the internet. Her parents knew she really liked spending time online, maybe a bit too much, but they never saw any signs that she was up to something suspicious. Her bedroom door was usually open if she wasn't practicing or singing, and they kept an eye on her. But despite their constant watch over her, she discovered very weird corners of the internet while browsing on her iPad. What he didn't know was that she was searching for disturbing things, like animals killing other animals. And when she met Morgan, things were never the same. Morgan and Anissa eventually met in sixth grade because they rode the same bus to school. Morgan's parents were happy that Morgan had finally made a close friend in the quiet neighborhood of Waukesha, Wisconsin. She had struggled making friends, so they were pretty happy to see Morgan socializing. But they didn't realize that her new best friend shared the same obsession with the Slender Man. They were just happy that Morgan wasn't lonely anymore. The two girls would spend their evening sharing videos online. A lot of Anissa's social media posts were videos of funny cats, bunnies eating raspberries, or toasters malfunctioning. Typical stuff for preteens. But deeper into her posts, there were more disturbing videos of animals killing mice, or quizzes you can take to see if you're a psychopath or a sociopath. She spent a lot of time on her iPad watching videos, and the more videos she watched, the further down the rabbit hole she got. Her fifth grade teacher noticed she couldn't connect with other kids at school, and every few weeks she would start crying in the middle of class because the other kids were being mean to her. So she started spending more time on the internet than talking with other kids. And it wasn't until Anissa met Morgan that she finally had someone to hang out with in person. It didn't take long for them to both realize that they had the same obsessions with scary things on the internet, especially Slender Man, and they spent a lot of time talking about him and the horrific things he did to children. They'd even make sketches of him in their notebooks and shared stories about him at school. And they both saw him like a strange imaginary friend. They also saw the internet as a place where they fit in with others like them. Through most of school, Morgan only had one other friend named Peyton Leitner. Her friends called her Bella. Morgan had known Bella since kindergarten and they had been good friends since fourth grade. Before they knew each other, Bella had seen Morgan sitting alone in fourth grade by herself with no one to talk to. So she went over and sat next to her. This small gesture meant the world to Morgan. Ever since then, Bella was one of Morgan's only friends besides Anissa. It didn't take long before all three of them started hanging out together. But Bella wasn't into the same stuff that Morgan and Anissa were. And she also thought that Anissa was cruel. Bella knew about Slenderman, but she didn't really have any interest in him like the other two. Because it scared her. But she supported Morgan's hobbies because they were friends. And she had no idea the crazy theories and plans they talked about in secret behind her back. 
Even though they were all friends, Morgan and Anissa had made a special private connection that Bella was never a part of. And it all revolved around the stranger, darker side of the internet and this character called Slenderman. I'm sure many of you out there know exactly who Slenderman is. You've probably seen him, you've run across him. I mean, there's been plenty of internet created horror characters. Another one that made the rounds a few years ago, Momo. Oh yeah. I'm sure you saw Momo. Mm -hmm. Honestly, Momo scares me more than Slenderman. That face. Yeah. It's, yeah, terrifying. Just you know, trying to, Slenderman reminds me a lot of the Strangers movie, oh, the mask that they yep. wear kind of, they mm -hmm. kind of look like, especially from afar, they're kind of just that blank white Nothing there, face yeah. there. But Slenderman became an internet phenomenon after being entered into an internet Photoshop contest on June 10, 2009. The contest asked users to create the best paranormal image they could. Eric Knudsen later submitted two black and white images, also known by his handle, Victor Surge. The two Photoshop pictures showed images of children and behind them, a tall, thin, spectral character lurked in the background. The strange creature became known as Slender Man, and his image spread across the internet not long after. And a bunch of different users started making different interpretations of him. And he can be found in posts across Tumblr, DeviantArt, YouTube, and 4chan's Paranormal Board. Slenderman's lore might date back to medieval Germany in the legend of Der Grossmann. In the 16th century, legend has it that the tall man, as he was known, stalked a village in southwest Germany near the Black Forest. Parents of the young villagers warned their children not to go near the forest since this was where the tall man lived. Or if they stayed up too late, the man would come and take them away. This reminds me a lot of La Llorona. It was almost like a tactic to mm. keep their kids in line a little bit, like go to bed on time or you know, kind of get a visit. Yeah, exactly. The children who dared venture into the forest rarely returned home. The tall man would lure them deep into the trees by whispering voices in their heads. If the children caught a glimpse of Derek Grossman, they would see he was incredibly tall and thin, which made him blend in with the trees of the black forest. If they ever looked up at his head, they would notice he had no facial features at all. And sometimes multiple arms grew from his chest like tree branches. Sometimes he had no hands on the end and his arms were more like tentacles. The only children who safely returned from the forest were children who went straight home and confessed what they had done to their parents. In some versions of the tale, once they were in the forest, they never returned home at all. He would end up chasing them through the trees until he eventually caught them with his multiple arms and no one knows what he would do to the children since none of the captured victims ever survived to actually tell the tale but it's believed generally that this old german folk tale of dare grossman went on to inspire the modern slenderman sure sounds like it and i think it's important to note like this idea of using kind of horror paranormal creatures to to scare children into doing the right thing has been going on since virtually the beginning Ages. of time yeah i mean you look at krampus you look at all yes, these yeah. other you know sort of cryptid creatures and and paranormal and brothers Grimm and hansel and gretel and all these, yeah. these stories of kids encountering these evil beings and creatures throughout and adventures and you'll probably cross that bridge with holly eventually where yeah. you're just like look i can't logically explain why you have to go to bed you just need to or else some, yeah. something's gonna snatch you or the boogeyman yeah there you go Sutterman's kind of like the boogeyman yeah he's a modern day boogeyman yeah yeah only 10 days after eric newtson released his images of slenderman in 2009 the figure also started showing up in online videos and that's where things take a turn when you people start creating the videos and nowadays with technology the videos look sometimes real. very real yeah and it's honestly pretty scary like some of the, the videos that are out there slender man i'm not gonna lie are pretty creepy it's always like people running and he's just you yeah. barely get a glimpse of him or something or he's just like in a window somewhere but one of the most famous was a web series called marble hornets posted on june 20th 2009 the story follows a young film school student who stumbles on Slenderman while filming his first feature length film project. In only three years, the channel got 250,000 subscribers and 55 million views. 
Several more series were inspired by the story, including Every Man Hybrid and Tribe 12. But soon there was countless videos of Slenderman sightings that were posted weekly around the world, and they were often shot like found footage horror movies. And Slenderman can be seen in the background stalking children. There was also a video game called Slender, The Eight Pages, in 2012. And in the game, you're stalked by Slenderman as you gather lost pages of art scattered around a foggy forest. The more pages you get, the thicker the fog becomes and the faster Slenderman stalks you. This internet monster even made it to the silver screen in 2018 in the movie Slenderman. As Slenderman's popularity spread, creepypastas about him also went viral at the peak of his popularity. For those who don't know, we've mentioned this at the beginning, creepypasta is basically just a popular horror story that gets copied and pasted across the internet over and over. And as it spreads, other users often tweak the story and add to it. But it's really written in kind of this like first person point of the view most of the time where it's yeah. like people experiencing yep. the entity or, or creature. So it feels more real. Right. These creepy pastas about Slender Men eventually reached Morgan and Anissa, and they became obsessed with reading different horror stories on Creepypasta Wiki website. Slender Man constantly changes depending on who's telling the story. But mostly they all have similar descriptions. And I kind of told you a little bit about what he looks like. But he's a very tall, thin figure between 6 to 14 feet. He's always wearing that black suit, it seems like. He doesn't have a face, which is, I think, partly what makes him so creepy. And his skin is blank white. And he rarely ever speaks. But when he does, it's usually through telepathy. He's known to stalk his prey, which are often young kids. And in fan-made photos and videos, he can be seen hiding in dark forests, stalking playgrounds, scaling walls, and sneaking into bedrooms at night. But since he's an internet meme, his stories have changed through the years. And this might be the scariest part about Slenderman, especially for children. He can be whatever you imagine him to be. He is literally the modern-day boogeyman. And for Anissa and Morgan, the Slenderman was a collection of everything that they feared. Anissa believed he quietly stalked his prey and read their minds. When he was ready to attack, his slimy tendrils would explode from his back and wrap around his victim's neck. Some theories suggest that the mythos of Slenderman is brought on by this concept. It's called the Tulpa effect. Have you ever heard of this? I haven't heard of the Tulpa effect. What's that? I'll try and give it to you in layman's terms, but the idea stems from Buddhist ideology, but the effect it's basically this idea that if enough people believe that something is real it can actually manifest in the real world that's the general gist of of what the tulpa you know what this reminds me of have you ever seen the movie the empty man no oh have you seen it no you haven't seen the empty man no oh man don't you guys think they should watch that movie (laughs) so that's i'm pretty sure that is a depiction exactly of what tulpa is oh really yeah so it's like it's this entity that a bunch of people sort of believe in and bring to life it ends up being like kind of like a cult but it's weird because there's a scene of i think it's like in the tibetan mountains and the the, tracks like the skeleton that is the empty man i believe i could be wrong but people like pilgrimage up to it to him and like crazy shit happens and there's this whole group of people that all believe in the power of this empty man but they've essentially manifest this entity um to life that has to be inspired by so Tulpa. i think that's exactly yeah. what it is but honestly one of the best horror movies i've seen in recent years really yeah i mean okay. it's i don't even know it's necessarily horror it's more probably more thriller than horror movie but okay creepy very right, good check very well out. done you guys would like it and it tracks if you're saying it was in the Tibetan yeah, mountains. Tibetan mountains you know, the and Buddhist yeah, Tibetan mountains. Buddhist ideology. Yeah, kinda, I think that's exactly what it's based on. Gotcha. A tulpa exists in a shared mind and it has its own identity and autonomy. And there are entities that are just strictly generated in the mind. But unlike something like an imaginary friend who we kind of control, tulpas can just completely act and think on their own once they're manifested in the real world. Did you ever have an imaginary friend growing up? No. No, I never did. Yeah, me neither. Danny? No. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, no, I never thing. went 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 there for some reason. And, and I would I would assume that people that have imaginary friends sometimes don't have as many real yeah. human friends. And I mean, I could be wrong on that, but yeah, I never never like 
had an imaginary friend. I knew people that did. Like, oh yeah, this is my imaginary friend. I'm like, cool. Can't, yeah. Don't see him. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> Sorry. I mean, I was but, friends with like my toys. Like I would, my, oh, my toys yeah. would have names and like they were my quote unquote friends, but I'd, yeah, at least they were yeah. tangible, I guess. Same, yeah. yeah. That, I, yeah, I guess that kind of counts, but I did too. I had the same thing, but so if you could tie that into kind of Morgan and Anissa, they're obviously not the most popular kids in school. They don't have many friends. So, you know, tying this back into this kind of imaginary friend concept, but the difference with Tulpas is that they are their own entities in the end of the day. It's like when in the writing world, they say that if you can create a character good enough and it feels like its own person, the story just writes itself by the end of it. I know kind of Tarantino talks about that in his movies where he's like the last act should kind of write itself because once you get all these characters manifested and they feel genuine enough, it should kind of just lead the way. So it's in it's in that kind of vein. But in the case of a tulpa, it's not a demonic possession, dissociative identity disorder, or a psychotic break. Mm. It is just its own thing in the ideology. And in the case of Slenderman, as his popularity grew, so many people believed that he was real that the theory goes that maybe he did manifest, you know, in some mm -hmm. way. Um, for some, the, it wasn't just an internet meme anymore. It was a, a real creature that you come across in your everyday life. So you, could you attribute this to a lot of cryptids out there, like people who believe in Bigfoot? That is kind of in the same vein. Which yeah. I'm, there is some physical evidence and some other stuff that backs the existence of Bigfoot up. Yeah. I'm not saying that it's just like this manifested made up creature necessarily, but I think a lot of people look at that as that's an example of of Tulpa. Yeah. The Tulpa effect of get like, enough people to believe in this thing and it becomes real. Yeah. Or really any, I mean, any cryptid for that matter would basically be. But it, it is a little bit different because a lot of the cryptids are based on real life actually existing creatures or they're like hybrids and things like that. So right. maybe that's not a great example but yeah and since this is i think that is the one big difference is this was more like an internet meme which i don't think we've ever seen any cryptids just come from the internet you know mm. it's interesting though i was just i was just looking up tulpa while you're explaining uh, what it is and apparently modern practitioners use the term tulpa mancers for themselves oh yeah, I know people do Total it and answers. like they sit in a room and they generally just try and manifest things into reality. It's this willed imaginary friend which practitioners consider to be sentient and relatively independent. And modern practitioners predominantly consider tulpas to be a psychological entity versus a paranormal concept. Which is that makes sense, yeah. I could see that. It's a product product of the mind, right? Wow. So then it comes down to, do you believe you can manifest things with your mind and like how powerful can you will things into existence? And that's a whole nother, it's yeah. like oh, more of a theological. If I had that power, I would just, I'd quit my job and I just start willing things into existence constantly. Cause then, I mean, that leads you to like the law of attraction and everything else. It's yes. Like, yeah. you know, do you believe in the law of attraction? Uh, no, but I think that the positivity that comes from that mindset is kind of how you get what you want. If you set a goal for yourself and you just believe that these things will happen, I think just that positive mindset. It's the like foundation you, you need to yeah. work towards accomplishing your goal. And because I think at the end of the day, you have to and do the work act on it. Yeah, sure. Sure. Interesting. Tulpa, the Tulpa effect, though. Tulpa, I had never interesting concept. I had never heard of it until this case. Sentient imaginary friend conjured up through thought. For Morgan and Anissa, they began to believe that Slenderman was a strange guardian angel. He was the Grim Reaper, but with a gentle heart, he could be violent but also merciful. Some stories they read even mentioned Slenderman watching over the children and protecting them from harm, even though it seemed like he was stalking them. The two girls might have seen Slenderman as just another lonely friend, 
but the idea of a friendly predator isn't anything new. Everyone knows the medieval story of the Pied Piper, right? He eventually lures all of the children out of town and into a secret chamber in the mountainside never to be seen again. He's a character that's been depicted in different ways through the centuries and people argue over whether he's good or evil. The story of a mysterious character haunting children is an old tale because there's something universal about it. And Morgan and Anissa were sucked into this idea of a real boogeyman watching their every move, especially because they were children. But their fear stemmed from reality. Morgan would see things in the news where predators captured kids and did terrible things to them. She saw that there were real boogeymen out there in the world, and Morgan struggled with separating fantasy from reality like most kids do, but to a much more extreme level. Kids are already open to the idea of fantasy characters existing in real life like Santa Claus, a tooth fairy, or even a monster under your bed. But Morgan believed in Slenderman on a whole different level. He wasn't just a story or a photoshopped image. He was real. After becoming friends and bonding over their obsession with Slenderman, Morgan told Anissa that she had seen Slenderman when she was only five years old. This wasn't just a spooky story. Morgan genuinely believed she saw him and that he even haunted her dreams. Morgan believed that when Slenderman stalked his prey, he could infiltrate his victim's dreams, and his victims can see him when no one else does. Even though Slenderman scared Anissa and Morgan, something about his paranormal powers excited them. They became obsessed with the idea that Slenderman might be some sort of dark and twisted guardian angel out there. So they dug deeper and deeper into the creepypastas and the Slenderman lore. Anissa eventually believed that Slenderman had these things called proxies, which were his servants. Morgan convinced Anissa that they should try to become the Slenderman's proxies. And Anissa agreed, but she asked how they could make it happen. And sometime in December of 2013, Morgan had an idea. She told Anissa they needed to kill their friend Bella. It was the only way to convince Slenderman that they were loyal to him. At first, the idea was only a sick fantasy that they talked about in private. And if they successfully became proxies, they would get to live in Slender Mansion, a place where all the other creepypasta characters lived. It was a massive house that they believe existed somewhere in Nicolette National Park. Anissa was surprised at Morgan's idea, but she couldn't deny that she was also excited. As time went on, it wasn't just about becoming a proxy. Morgan soon believed that Slenderman could personally communicate with her. According to her, he appeared one night while she slept. He stood over her bed, stretching his long, skinny body over her. His blank face looked down, and he telepathically communicated to her. In a low, gurgling voice that echoed through her head, he threatened to kill Morgan and Anissa's families if they didn't become his proxies. Shocked, Morgan told Anissa what he had said to her, and over time Anissa came to believe her. The two girls were terrified that their families could be brutally murdered if they didn't listen to what he said. So, they began to think of a plan while their delusions spiraled out of control. For Morgan's 12th birthday, she had a sleepover with her friends over at her parents' house on May 30th, 2014. It had been nearly five months since they first came up with the idea to kill their friend Bella. For her birthday, Morgan invited Anissa and Bella over. To Morgan's mom, it just looked like any other sleepover. The three girls were giggling and joking with each other. And as far as she could tell, there was nothing to be worried about. During the day, they went to Skateland, a roller skating center. Morgan's mom watched as they all had fun roller skating, holding hands and laughing, just having a good time. And afterward, they went back to Morgan's house. The girls then headed into the basement where Anissa pulled out her iPad and Bella pulled out her tablet. Everyone played on their devices, watching videos and playing games. According to Morgan, the two girls secretly prepared to attack Bella that night. They even gave each other code names. Morgan was Kitty and Anissa was Scorpion. The initial plan was to kill Bella in the basement and cover her with blankets to make it look like she was sleeping. Then they would leave her there and run away from the house. But they didn't go through with it. They both decided that Bella would get one more day to live. So they went back to their devices and eventually fell asleep that night. The next morning, May 31st, 2014, they had donuts and strawberries for breakfast. The three girls laughed and seemed like they were having a good time. Morgan's mom was happy to see her daughter enjoying time with her friends. It was rare for Morgan to have any friends over, especially for a sleepover. When they were done eating, they asked if they could go over to David's Park, which was not far from the house. 
They said that they were going to bird watch and play games, and Morgan's mom didn't think anything of it. Before they left, Morgan said goodbye to her mom, and she told her she loved her. But just before leaving, Morgan secretly grabbed a knife with a five-inch blade from the kitchen block and snuck it into her jacket pocket. As they headed out and walked to the park, she lifted up her jacket and showed Anissa the knife. She made sure that Bella wasn't looking. That was the moment Anissa realized they were actually going to follow through with their evil plan. They were really going to try and murder their friend, Bella. As they walked toward the park, all Anissa could think about was the fear of seeing her friend's dead body. The last time she saw one was at her uncle's funeral, and she didn't want to see another one. She began feeling anxious and sick. When they got to the park, they played on the swings in the jungle gym before heading over to the public bathroom. The bathroom was dark and damp and no one else was around. As Anissa looked down, she noticed a small drain in the center of the floor. They thought about stabbing Bella, letting her blood flow down the drain and hiding her in the bathroom stall. At that moment, Anissa remembered all the creepy pasta wiki she had read about killing people. She had read that it was easier to kill people while they were unconscious because if their eyes were open, the killer could see their reflection in them. And it would be like killing themselves. So Anissa asked Bella if she could close her eyes and put herself to sleep. But Bella refused and looked at her two friends in confusion. Seeing that she wouldn't listen, Anissa clenched her fist and hit Bella in the head. She stumbled backward and hit her head against the bathroom wall before falling to the floor. Then Morgan whispered to Anissa, saying that she had to do it. But after they both hesitated, Morgan began freaking out. She realized that their plan had finally become real, and she was too scared to follow through. When Anissa saw Morgan freaking out, she hugged her, hoping to calm her down. Neither of them could commit to stabbing their friend. As Bella got up from the floor, confused, they all left the bathroom. Anissa tried to change plans and said they should all go into the woods and play hide and seek instead. Bella tried to brush off what had just happened. She couldn't even imagine what her two friends had planned behind her back, but she figured something was off. So she told the other girls that she didn't want to play hide and seek. To try and make her feel better, Morgan and Anissa told her that she could pick a game for them to play. As they wandered away from the bathroom, Anissa led Bella into the woods at the edge of the park. Morgan followed not far behind. They talked casually and tried to make everything seem normal again. When Morgan caught up to Anissa, she secretly handed her the knife without Bella seeing. Then the two of them made up a new plan. Again, Morgan told Anissa that she had to be the one to do it, but Anissa handed the knife back to her, telling her that if she wanted Bella dead, she would have to do it herself. Again, she reminded her to make sure Bella was unconscious first so she couldn't look into her eyes. Morgan then made a deal with Anissa. She said she would stab Bella, but only when Anissa commanded her to. They argued back and forth for a few minutes until Anissa agreed. After stepping a few paces away from them, Anissa turned to check to see if anyone was around. She then turned to Morgan and said, Kitty, now. Morgan then whispered to Bella, Don't be afraid. I'm only a little kitty cat. Then she lunged at Bella and tackled her to the ground. She pinned her down and sat on her legs so she couldn't move. As she bent down to whisper into Bella's ear, she said, I'm so sorry. She then stabbed Bella in the torso. Over and over, Morgan stabbed Bella 19 times across her body. As she was doing it, she thought it didn't feel like anything when the knife pierced the skin. She said it felt like air as she pulled the knife out of the wounds and stabbed her again. Bella screamed, I trusted you. And after several stab wounds, she whispered, I hate you. As Morgan kept stabbing her, she began to fade and she kept saying, I can't see, I can't see. But during the entire attack, Bella never lost consciousness. After Morgan finished stabbing her, she stood up and looked down at her friend covered in blood lying in the dirt. Anissa then grabbed Bella's legs and began dragging her from the road deeper into the woods. When she let go, Anissa began to feel guilty and she told Bella to lie down and keep quiet so she wouldn't lose blood as quickly. Then she lied, promising Bella they would go and get help. But instead, they just abandoned her and left her to slowly die in the woods. And the two girls took off running as fast as they could. The plan was to run as far as possible until they reached the Slenderman Mansion and the Nicolette Forest. But they didn't realize that the forest was nearly 240 miles away. They would never make it. After a while, Anissa began to second guess everything. Her legs grew tired and she began crying. All she wanted to do was call her mom and tell her everything that had happened. 
but Morgan stopped and told her that she would spend the rest of her life in prison if she did that. She even told her they might be executed for what they did. After that, Anissa fell to the ground crying and she began blaming Morgan for everything. Then Morgan started to cry along with her, which surprised Anissa because Morgan rarely cried. The two girls then just sat in the woods together for a while, just crying. After a moment, Morgan said, Slenderman, if you're listening, help us. She thought that they might have become proxies after stabbing Bella and he might help them now, like a guardian angel. But of course, nothing happened. During all of this, Bella bleeding out in the woods somehow found the strength to crawl out. She made it to the edge of David's Park and found the closest road where she was spotted by a man on a bicycle. You can only imagine what that cyclist saw and how he felt when he saw Bella crawl out of the woods. And so he called the police. Here's audio from that call. One, one. What's the address of your emergency? Waukesha County, Lenny. I'm transferring over a caller on Big Bend at the dead end just south of Rivera. And he came upon a 12-year-old female. She appears to be stabbed. She appears to be what? Stabbed. Stabbed? Correct. Okay. Sir, you still there? Yes. Hi, sir. So is are you with this 12-year-old female? Yeah. She says she's having trouble breathing. She said she was stabbed multiple times. Stabbed multiple times? <laughs> yeah. Okay, sir, are you with her right now? Yes. Is she awake? She's awake. Is she um, breathing? Yeah, she's breathing. She said she can take shallow breaths. She's alert. Okay, stay with her. We're sending the police department. Don't hang up, okay? Okay. Okay. Hold on, Smith, sir. We're sending officers. Okay. Is there any assailant around? Uh, I didn't even look. I don't see anybody. Is there any bleeding going on? Her clothing has got blood on it. Where are the wounds? Do you see where the wounds are? No, I am i don't know if I should be rolling her over and checking or not. Okay, just stay with her and just let me know if she's conscious or alert or stops breathing or anything. Hold on, I'm going to talk to the ambulance. Police are also en route. I'm bothering you at all? You want shade? Okay. Who did that to you? Why don't you want to talk? If you better not to talk, then you won't talk. Give your energy. When police arrived, they asked who did this to her. And all Bella could say was, her friends. They then rushed her to the hospital and discovered that two of the wounds had sliced through major organs, cutting into her liver and her stomach. Another stab wound missed the major artery of her heart by less than a millimeter. That's... wow. If the blade had connected to that artery, she most likely would have died before ever reaching the hospital. After arriving at the ER, Bella would go through six hours of surgeries and spend almost an entire week in the hospital being treated for her multiple wounds. Morgan and Anissa were eventually spotted off of I-94 at a nearby furniture store. They had walked almost five miles before giving up, and the two of them clearly looked suspicious since they were both covered in dark, red blood. When the local sheriff pulled up to the store, he approached the girls and noticed that they looked completely out of it. When he asked Anissa why she looked so scared, she said that if she told him, he would think she was crazy. He then searched their bag and found a kitchen knife covered in blood. He then brought both of the girls back to the station for questioning. And at the police station, the two girls were interrogated separately without their parents or an attorney present. And both were very open about what had happened. Here are some of those clips from their interrogations. Just a heads up, the audio isn't great. So if you're listening on audio platform, Maybe check out the video on Spotify or YouTube because we do have subtitles. Will I regret giving you this information later? You know, this information we use to try to get you some help so we you don't have to hear those screams and don't have to worry about hurting anybody anymore. Okay. That's the goal here, okay? So we got to figure out how we're going to do that. So the, isn't the wall floor by PDQ? You know where that's at? Mm -hmm. You think that's what you went to? Sure, I don't know. You don't know? Is there anything else you remember that was around there? No, I just remember that we went forward and forward and forward and then we passed a bunch of buildings. We went through downtown Waukesha, we went everywhere. And actually we were singing the whole time. We just started singing songs to each other. We were surprisingly calm, actually. It was like we had each just killed someone or probably killed someone or stabbed someone. 
So how did you guys, did you guys get a ride from anybody? You guys just kept walking? No, we got a, we got there by ourselves. Do you remember walking around the railroad tracks or street? We walked across the railroad tracks one time, and then we went, we went into a few like ditches with, or with forests and trees. And I remember we tried to find Slenderman. Trying to find who? Slender. Who's Slenderman? He's, um... He's a this tall, faceless man who preys on children. We were in the forest and we couldn't help ourselves. So is it a tall, faceless man? Mm-hmm. Or are you trying to find him? What? Or are you trying to find him? Because when Jesus said he could help us. I sort of thought that he might kill us if we did find him, though, because he has a tendency to do that. Have you ever met him? No. We've never seen him. Who tells you about him? He's everywhere. Really? Because I've read so many things about him. Why did you read something about him? How creepy about this. Lisa thinks he's real, and she also thinks Jack the Killer is real because there's somebody in Milwaukee who's called the Smiley Face Killer, and she thinks that Jack the Killer is him. And then there was. What is it? What did you look at me? Creepy what? Creepy pasta. There's a website. Uh huh. It's called Creepy Pasta Wikia. Wait, Creepy Pasta dot Wikia dot dot something. So that was Morgan giving some initial words to the investigator. I do want to say, I I think it's a major issue that police are investigating minors without a parent present or a lawyer or a lawyer at the very, you know, at least I think it's taking advantage of their authority over them by making them feel like that's not an option before they start talking to police. But I'm the the words I felt no remorse, I felt nothing is very chilling to hear come out of her mouth and I think lends to where she where she's at mentally. Yeah. And just how deep into this they were. And she also mentioned she felt it was necessary. Mm -hmm. There was something necessary about what they were doing, which is also chilling. And they're telling the investigator about Slenderman, like as if it's just a matter of fact, right? Yeah. Like, oh yeah, Slenderman. That's what we're doing this for. Yeah. He's this faceless man. After you stabbed Peyton. I don't really know. I figured that I'd get in trouble eventually, though, because um, I Mommy always says that whatever you do catches up to you eventually. And it did. Did you guys think about what happened to you? I did. Anissa didn't seem to think anything would happen. One time she said, can we come home yet? And I said, no, we're going to get arrested if we go home. And then she said, oh yeah, I forgot. Thanks, Morgan. And then I said, okay. 
just told I wanted to be locked up so that I couldn't hurt her, but that time is past and now I'm in here because we were careless. I knew this would happen. I knew we'd get in trouble. Well, we're just trying to sort this all over right now to figure out what all happens. So you want to get locked up so you can control? I don't want... I wanted to... I didn't really genuinely want to be locked up, but at one point I sort of did. Just... It seemed... So you decided a while ago that in the sleep overnight that this is what you did? Yeah. Why do you think it was your sleep overnight that your Because sleep overnight? it was... We, were all, we would all be together. It was... A flawless plan, actually. I've wanted to hurt people before, but they're not nice to me, so they deserve it. Oh, Why did you want to hurt her? Because it was necessary. Why was it necessary? I don't know. Tree to put the dead end. Yeah, she's prepared. Sammy's dead, 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 dead. Hide and seek. What's that? I already told you. So you guys got the knife from your mom's house. You guys ended up going to the park. Yeah. And then you guys went down by the woods. Why did you guys go over by the woods? Because we knew what we had to do. We led her there and tricked her. The last thing she said was me to to me was, I trusted you. And then she said, I hate you. And then we lied to her. And Lisa said that she'd go get help. I didn't have anything to do with the lying. Well, that was all I needed. She said we were going to go get How did you trick her to get down there? We said that we were going to go bird watching. People who trust you become very gullible. And it was sort of sad. So you guys told her going to go bird watch and then what happened? And then we said that we were going to play hide and seek, and then and he said, jumped her, and then it was like, it happened really fast, and I keep trying to forget. So you were playing hide and seek? Mm -hmm. Because normally we like playing hide and seek, because hide and seek's a fun game. I like hiding. So you and then Anissa jumped her? Mm-hmm. And she said Morgan, now. Well, actually she said Kitty, because her code names for each other were Scorpion and Kitty. She was a scorpion because she tends to be aggressive, things like that. So she said Kitty now, and what did that mean? Um, my name was Kitty because, well, she sort of, I have four cats at home, and she says that I act like a cat sometimes. I so when she said Kitty now, what did she do? Then we stabbed her. Who, had, who stabbed her first? I think, um, and he stopped her first, and then I continued, and then, like, she was like, Morgan, make sure she doesn't escape, and then it was like, uh... So you think that it was Anisha first? Mm-hmm. You sure? Yeah. Not really. It's sort of confusing, because I've been trying to block out the screams all day. So how many times, so then how did you get the knife from Anissa? She sort of just shoved it into my hand, and there it was. And then I didn't know what I did, it was, it sort of just happened. It didn't feel like anything, it was like air. So she put the knife in your hand, and what'd you do? I just you know what happened, didn't you? 
No, I just didn't really go. Somebody else is talking to her. I need so you to continue to stab her? Mm-hmm. And then we decided that, and then Lisa said that it was enough, and then Bella was like, I can't see, I can't see, and then I said, I'm sorry. This had to happen, and she was like, why? And then I, I said that I was just, it was necessary. I can't. I can't explain why. Please don't cut off my head. Nobody's gonna cut off your head. So I have to, so you guys, how many times do you think you stabbed her? I don't know. It happened very quickly. All I heard was screaming. How many times did you guess? I don't know. What are your thoughts on Morgan's testimony there? Mm. Yeah, it's hard to say. Um, Because it's interesting that she tries to pin it on Anissa. Even though she's confessing everything, she still tries to say that Anissa stabbed her first. Like, I think she still has some concept of getting into trouble with the law. So I'm not sure why she's so open about everything else, but then she's like, no, it was Anissa who stabbed her first, and then I, I went ahead and did it too. Um, she's clearly intelligent yeah. is, is what I'm getting, especially there at the end. She's talking about EMF and radiation. I mean, these are intelligent teenagers. I mean, yeah. this is bringing me back to Nicholas Browning quite a bit. Oh, I think they're 12. They're and 12. they're younger, yeah. yeah. Yeah, they're even younger, and so by a few years but even even so they seem fairly mature for their age for a 12 year old mm-hmm. um i mean she speaks very well as far as like what what happened what they were doing and i just can't get over the the cold coldness of her voice whenever she's describing it, especially stabbing yeah it's there's she, no emotion there whatsoever of like that's our friend. I mean, this was their good friend, like yeah. their only friend, really. She kept saying it was necessary. And then she's like, I've just tried to forget it. And there was like so much screaming, but she says it in such a plain voice. Yeah. I mean, it's clearly so evident that they're just delusional, absolutely delusional about what everything that just happened and really about their whole belief system in general and Slenderman and that they really felt like they were doing something that had a real effect to it. And it, the real effect was ultimately them getting arrested and, and all of that. But in their minds, they really thought they were going to go see the Slender Man. Yeah. And ultimately, I mean, or, they're just doing a good job at using that as their excuse at this point. And that's, that's the hard part too, is like, do they really believe in this or is that just the excuse they're using to try and seem like they're, you know, they were just crazy and they wanted to, but in actuality they were cold blooded killers. They know what they were doing. Do you think like a 12 year old has the capacity to do that? That's the hard part. I mean, that's the major, major controversy there. And, but then I, but then you think, you know, I think everything can stem back to this idea of are people born evil or are they born good and they develop this evil over time or it's always within them and 
certain things bring it out of them i mean it's a whole whole other thing but yeah i think mental illness also has a play as we'll here. see yeah. mental illness is definitely a major factor in, in this case but let's let's hear a little bit from anisa what she said Um, this is about Morgan. She can be a little dopey and might get off task and look around and forget what she's saying in the middle of a sentence a lot. Hmm. Okay. Because, like, she says she hears voices, too. But I just wanted to tell you. So, so we're aware of that. Maybe not to put off by that then. Okay. Well, thank you for telling me that. Okay. It's weighing a bit heavier on her than it is Morgan. I do think it's interesting that that's like one of the first things she says about Morgan. Yeah. Is that she hears voices. Because do you think that they looked up consequences for this action? Like, do you you think they looked up like what might happen if we get caught and arrested? And is there a way to play this in, in a similar way that Nicholas did a horrible job at trying to play, you know, like the insanity card and I'm crazy and because it, it seems like that's an overarching theme among many of these types of cases. And I think it's also this, a major misunderstanding of, and I know I thought the same thing when I was younger too, is like, if you're crazy, then they just put you in a hospital and you know, that's a better punishment than being sent to prison for the rest of your life. And I almost wonder if they looked that up and read into that a little bit and hence why she's kind of, saying this or is this all genuine her being just truthful about the situation yeah that's a good question i know that you know apparently when they were walking after they had committed the stabbing morgan does bring up you know anisa kind of falls down crying and, and morgan's like we're gonna go to prison if we don't just keep walking we got to keep going to you know find the slender mansion or whatever it was but so she clearly knew that prison was uh, potential and she even goes so far as to say we might get executed for doing this. So I think at yeah, least Morgan did understand that there were ramic- ramifications for doing something like this. Now, yeah, that's a good question that I never really thought of that when Anissa is saying, you know, Morgan hears voices. Is she just letting them know that Morgan's a little, maybe she's got something going on or is she, yeah, is she playing into this like, okay, maybe we can play the insanity card. I don't know if a 12 year old can, I don't know. I guess that is a time when, I don't know. I don't think you're, you're capable of lying by then and, and being a little conniving, but that would be quite a feat. I think for a 12 year old to uh, try and play that card. I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility though. I think at that age you're, I mean, you're able to, depending on who you are, you're able to read at a high level and they have the, internet at their fingertips i mean they can look anything up watch a video and i think you can comprehend to some extent what's going on my the biggest question i have is how did they not look at how far this forest was like how did they make such a big misjudgment there yeah and that is the piece that brings me back to they're 12 they aren't able to really put everything together quite the same as say a 15 year old could who's going to be turning 16 who can drive you know the development there there is a big jump from 12 to 15 16 yeah and maybe it's just the concept of distance didn't really make sense to them maybe they never realized like how far a mile is they didn't realize maybe they've never walked you know a mile or multiple miles before so maybe they just assume that 240 miles was a walkable distance but that to me is like a major question mark in my head of like why it seems like everything else is pretty understood they seem to have some knowledge around what they did the punishments the consequences but they made a major error when it comes to the distance at which they would have to go to get to slender man's mansion yeah they're still clearly very naive and don't understand a lot of things it's a good point What else did Anise have to say? So, did you think that you actually had to kill somebody to do it? Yeah. Like, for real? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and then there's another killer called um, Jeff the Killer on the Creepypasta Wiki, but he's 
Um, that's actually a real person, Jeffrey Woods. He supposedly murdered his whole family, so we're in there. Um, found that out. We're just like, okay, so we know at least Jeff is real. Okay. So we wanted, so we got our hopes up and thought that everybody else was real. Okay. And then Jeff is called what online? Jeff the Killer. And supposedly he, um, he went insane, so he burned off his eyelids and took a butcher knife and cut a big smile on his face. And his, his supposedly long black hair about down to here and um, ice blue eyes. That's what the wiki says also. And he killed a bunch of people? Mm-hmm. Including his own family. That's what the news reports is anyway. Okay. So he's considered a slender? No, he's considered a killer. He's considered a killer. Okay. Hence just the killer. Yep. And he's known to exist. News reports say that he exists. If you go on Google Images and search Jeffrey Woods news article, a bunch of news articles will come up and then there'll be a picture of excuse me, a seventeen year old boy with um who kinda looks like me but has but it was a black and white picture. Mm-hmm. And he has kind of the same hair as me also. Okay. Did you cut your hair to make it look like this? No. No. It was just, just coincidence. coincidence. And so you guys knew that Jeff the Killer, an actual killer in this triangle, exists. So you thought it would be exciting to find out, hey, if we can prove, if we can be a proxy and prove and do this, kill, kill Bella, then we know that Slender exists. If we saw him, actually, we, we think we see him sometimes. Okay. Like when we were walking up to where, to where we were going, um, we saw him, like, I saw him out of the corner of my eye on this side. Okay. And then Morgan said she, her like, twig cracked when no one was moving. So today, after everything happened with Bella, when you guys were walking, you thought you saw Slender as you were walking? This was after Morgan stabbed her. Okay. So you thought that possibly you would see the Slender? Mm-hmm. Okay. She brought up uh, Jeff the Killer, which is another creepypasta thing, and she was so convinced that this was a real person, which as far as I could find, is not a real person. But that's kind of the, that was the gimmick of creepypasta for so long, was that, yeah, it was like really trying to convince these people that whoever was reading it, that these things actually did happen. Um, so yeah, then she ties it into Slenderman. They're like, okay, well, if this exists and this is on creepypasta and this is in the same vein of things that we're already reading about, that must mean there must be truth to Slenderman as well, which I find fascinating. Yeah, and, and your research skills as a 12-year-old aren't great. I mean, she mentioned type in Jeffrey Woods, Google Images, and and I did as she was saying this, yep. and there is an image of a boy that comes up, but it's linked back to, there's Nothing. no notable source that it yep. goes back to it goes back to blogs or other people talking about jeff the killer yeah. and it's just a picture of this young boy but there is no jeff wood or woods associated with being a killer or anything like that the closest thing i found to it was a man named jeffrey lee wood and he is on death row in texas um what was his crime do you know i mean it must have been murder yeah he, he murdered um somebody but he apparently had the IQ of a child. Um, so it was a very controversial um, death penalty case. But but yeah, I, I don't think it has any association with where Jeffrey the killer came from. So just it's completely made up. But because she found some images through Google, she's thinking it's legit. And, and it's a real picture of a boy. Right. Yeah. As far as we know, I mean, it, honestly, to me, the image looks like uh, created on the computer 
or Photoshop or something like that. It doesn't even look like a real image, and there's only one of it. Yeah, one of this boy. Here's here's what else she had to say. Did you think that you guys killed Morgan? Um, or I mean, uh, Pete Bella? Yeah. Um, I, but first Morgan said I should do it and that she didn't know what to do. So I hand, and I, so I handed her the knife that she brought with and, um, said you do it, I'm too squeamish. And, um, she got the knife from her house. We asked her mom if we could play outside, and her and her and her mom said sure. So we went playing at the park, and then I said, hey, why don't we go take a wild walk? So we walk, walked, and then there was this grove of trees that we went into, and then we were trying to play hide and seek in the trees to like distract her. So Morgan and I were also debating on um, who does the deed. And um, at first it was me, but like I said, I was too squeamish and said, no, you do it. So um, Morgan said, whenever you want. So like I finally just had enough and said it now because I was starting to get a little freaked out. And then Morgan jumped on top of Bella and started stabbing her repeatedly. And that's when I turned around because I couldn't stand to that. Okay. And then um, the whole time Peyton was screaming and begging. <sighs> saying stuff like, I hate you guys. I'll never forgive you. And I trusted you. Still. And um, Sorry. Mm -hmm. As you can probably hear, another major difference is that Anissa seems to be showing emotion and visible grief and remorse there, it seems. Like yeah. she clearly feels bad about what she did. A much different demeanor than compared to Morgan. But from those clips, it does seem like she's shifting blame to Morgan. Yep. And like, oh, I was sort of guilty by association as opposed to being the one actually doing the deed and it was really morgan kind of seems like they're trying to shift the blame to each other yeah in each of their interrogations also during the interrogation officers checked anisa's phone and found a goodbye letter to her mom in the letter she said that she hoped they would remember her for good things that she did and that she wasn't going to hurt anyone else after the investigation morgan was charged with attempted first degree murder and Anissa was charged with attempted second-degree murder. Wisconsin law required that they both be tried as adults and face up to 65 years in prison, even though they were only 12 years old during the crime. Their lawyers argued that they should be tried as children in the juvenile justice system, where they would be released by the age of 18, but the court disagreed. So, obviously, after there was a lot of light shed on this case, the big thing was psychiatry psychologists had to come in because i mean even if you just watched some of that and listening to the things that they were saying there's probably you know it's clearly there were things to unpack mentally here so when psychologists first made their statements in court they determined that anisa was not susceptible to schizotypal personality disorder and the psychologists also believed that anisa did not have traits of a psychopath or a sociopath but this was a long road to determine their mental health. And later, three mental health experts did diagnose her with a shared delusional disorder or a shared psychotic disorder, also known as folly ado, which we've talked about, madness for two, right? And this is essentially when paranoid delusions are transmitted from one person to another. In this case, Morgan, usually we've talked about this, there's one instigator. There's one person that holds the main paranoia and then the second person kind of buys into it. So in this case, Morgan was seen as the instigator of the paranoid delusion. And the delusion was that they needed to kill four Slender Men. And one of those reasons was to become a proxy. And one of the other reasons was, remember, they, they felt threatened by Slender Men. They thought he was going to kill their entire family. 
So in this case, Anissa was the one that bought into that delusion. As for Morgan, she was later diagnosed with schizophrenia and oppositional defiant disorder. Oppositional defiant disorder is when someone is easily annoyed and loses their temper often. And according to the Mayo Clinic, early onset schizophrenia is extremely rare in children under 13. And Morgan was only 12 at the time of the stabbing. So this was an extremely rare case. The condition has a wide range of symptoms, but it usually results in some combination of hallucinations, delusions, and extremely disordered thinking. Supposedly, Morgan remembered having hallucinations as young as three years old. Um, she would see ghosts at night that would appear in her bedroom. They would hover over her bed, pull her hair, and bite her arms. She also saw majestic unicorns and even believed that one of her friends was a Pegasus. Other times, she was visited by Harry Potter characters, and later, she convinced herself that she had Vulcan mind powers, like in the TV show Star Trek. So it's clear that she, you know, through Harry Potter, Star Trek, and a Slender Man, it's clear that a lot of her delusions were being pulled from the media. media. Yeah. And before the stabbing, she was genuinely convinced that her life and the lives of her family members were being threatened by Slender Man. Investigators also found Barbie dolls inside Morgan's bedroom and they had strange markings on their bodies. Some of their hands and feet were cut off. In her notebooks, they found endless sketches of Slenderman and disturbing images that Morgan saw in her day-to-day -day life, especially images that she got from the internet. And in the end, they determined that she truly believed that Bella needed to be killed and that Slenderman had ordered her to do it. It was also later revealed that Morgan's dad, Matt, also had schizophrenia and the illness is known to be genetic. Even though schizophrenia affects only 1% of the population, it's believed that it's 90% heritable, according to the National Institutes of Health. So it's a high chance that you can get it from a parent. Um, but the difference was that for her dad, he's been treated and hospitalized four times, but He's also claimed that, especially in the HBO documentary, I remember him talking about it. He's, he's said that he's learned how to manage it over the years and he can have these hallucinations, but he knows how to recognize the difference between something that's real and something that's not. But for Morgan, those lines were still blurred, most likely because she was only 12 and didn't really understand what she was going through at the time. Um, and her parents worried that her time in jail would really only exacerbate this condition. And in the best case scenario, her parents desperately hoped she could go to a psychiatric facility. I'm just, I'm blown away at the, the thought that she was having hallucinations from basically three years old yeah. birth. It seems like, yeah, which her dad being schizophrenic, I wonder, but that's the thing too, is like, how do you know when to separate your child's imagination from actual hallucinations and know at what point you should probably seek out help for them? I think that's why this case is so fascinating because those things seem to overlap. You know, how do you tell that difference between a kid just having a very creative imagination and something genuinely wrong, you know, that's tough. I wonder as somebody who suffers from schizophrenia, if what he, if he ever thought in his mind, I'm sure he, he does now in hindsight, but now, now that she's been diagnosed with schizophrenia, if that's what was actually happening as opposed to maybe at the time he just thought it was, you know, he didn't want to think that she could potentially have schizophrenia maybe he didn't know that it was something that she could inherit but i mean it's 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 always easier to look at things in hindsight and be like you know should it could have done this should have done that yeah and there's you know she was also 12 which they even the mayo clinic says you know right under that's, 13, that's super rare so rare, yeah, yeah they probably were like there's no i wonder if there's any rare cases of it starting even sooner though right yeah that's that's really I mean, it's a giant mystery. Yeah. 
As a fan of Lights Out, you're probably very interested in real life horror stories. I know I am. And maybe you're wanting more content surrounding that topic. So today I'm here to tell you about a podcast called A Ghost Ruined My Life with Eli Roth from Travel Channel. On his podcast, you'll hear the real life stories of people who have been through terrifying confrontations with the unknown and come out alive. If you're not familiar with Eli Roth, he's the director of horror films like Hostel, Cabin Fever, The Green Inferno, Knock Knock, and he also has two other horror podcasts. But for this podcast, Eli has gone through hundreds of submissions from real people whose lives have been ravaged by a ghost, demon, or sinister entity. Each episode focuses on one person's story handpicked and introduced by Eli and retold by the victims themselves. They talk about some of the most terrifying, unexplainable events they've experienced, and now you can listen to a new season of all new real life stories of terror on a ghost ruined my life. You can listen to a ghost ruined my life with Eli Roth wherever you get your podcast. Check it out. It is definitely chilling. While in jail, Morgan was kept in a cell by herself, but while she was isolated, she knows her hallucinations kept her company. She spent a lot of her time constructing a dollhouse out of paper. She carefully tore small pieces of paper to make walls and furniture. She added tiny details to laptops and TVs, and each piece of furniture was unique and carefully designed. The hallucinations spoke with her throughout her stay in jail. Even after everything, Morgan still talked about how she loved Bella and still thought of her as a friend and all she wanted was to keep her friends. But while in jail, it became even harder to socialize with anyone. Morgan and Anissa were only allowed visits by their parents once every two weeks. They couldn't visit with anyone else, especially each other. About a year after the stabbing, Peyton had physically recovered from her wounds. She had spent a week in the hospital right after the stabbing, and it took several more months for her wounds to fully heal. Scars covered her body, and she still dealt with the emotional trauma of what had happened. Around the same time, the court determined that the crimes were violent, premeditated, and a personal offense. The judge had considered the age and brain development of the two girls, and he ordered that they should stay in adult court instead of juvenile court, which uh, I feel like I have to disagree with that in this yeah. case. Like, It's like, why have a juvenile court if you're not if gonna, you're not going to use it? And, and I guess reasons is the violent you know how violent the crime is but even then it's like it shouldn't just automatically push you into the adult court like that just seems very unfair and a complete waste of the juvenile court system agreed i don't know why they why they do that and i i understand the severity of the crime but and i don't want to you know treat it with brevity but she didn't die there was no murder victim here as as heavy as this case is we do i think that should have been taken more into account as well um and yeah like they did do something completely terrible but i don't really understand i it has to it's probably has to do with state law i'm assuming that they was keep them in adult court and they had to be they had to prove why they should be in juvenile court rather than the other way around which you would think would be yeah standard the whole system is just broken yeah. i mean just a lot of it just doesn't make any sense and i feel like a lot of judges have too much power to, yeah. to sway things one way or another and it seems like it's not always just the evidence it's perhaps how the judge feels about yeah. the case you know definitely both girls were kept in jail but for morgan this didn't really bother her at one point she said she didn't want to go outside anymore anyway Morgan was later moved to a state hospital where she volunteered to take antipsychotic medication. Anissa was held in the county jail for juveniles. So they're being held in juvenile jail, and yet they're being tried in adult court. Right. Make that make sense. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, the woods where Bella was stabbed was cleared out and leveled. In 2017, about three years after the stabbings, Anissa pled guilty to being a party to attempted second-degree homicide. A jury then found her not guilty due to mental disease or defect. However, she was sentenced to 25 years to life, involving at least three years of locked confinement and involuntary treatment in a state psychiatric institute. She was also required to have communal supervision until age 37. Morgan accepted a plea deal and agreed to be evaluated by psychiatrists to determine how long she should be placed in a mental hospital 
She later pled guilty, but was also found not guilty by reason of mental disease or defect in 2018. She was then given the maximum sentence of 40 years to life in a state hospital. She would also have to have at least three years locked confinement in addition to involuntary treatment in a state psychiatric institute until complete resolution of her symptoms or until age 53, whichever came first, which is the fact that the, the court systems are, are literally saying until complete resolution of your symptoms, like obviously your symptoms, and maybe that just means management of the symptoms, but as we've seen in other cases like the Vince Lee case where they said they completely resolved the, the disease basically yeah. and then released him. It's just yeah. wild to me that they're saying things like this. And it seems like that verbiage can be interpreted. Yeah, interpreted different yeah. ways. This would then be followed by continued communal supervision, periodic reevaluations with possible reinstitution and further treatment as needed. She would have the opportunity to petition for her release, but would remain under institutional care for the duration of her sentence. She was then placed in Winnebago Mental Health Institute, making her the youngest patient there. When Anissa was 19, she appealed to the court to be released from the state hospital, and it was determined that she was still diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder, major depression, and personality disorder, but the doctor said she no longer had a psychotic or delusional disorder. In the letter she wrote, she said, quote, I am sorry and deeply regretful for the agony and pain and fear I have caused not only to Peyton and her family, Peyton being Bella, but my community as well. I take full responsibility for my actions. She also said, quote, I hate my actions on May 31st, but through countless hours of therapy, I no longer hate myself for them. She then went on to promise to comply with any and all rules that the court and her treatment team would give her. One of her last statements was, quote, I'm not saying I'm done growing, changing, evolving, or adapting. I just can't do it here anymore. And then on July 1st, 2021, Anissa was granted release under several conditions after spending over three years in a state hospital. She'd be under supervision until the age of 37, but she would live with her dad and wear a 24-hour GPS tracking device. She'd also have limited internet use and not be allowed on any social media platforms. One last condition was that she would take medication and go to counseling sessions weekly. She was officially released on September 13th, 2021. As for Morgan, though, all of her later appeals were rejected. In August 2023, so very recently, she withdrew her latest petition for conditional release. Today, she's 21 years old and is still in Winnebago Mental Health Institute being treated for her conditions. As for Peyton or Bella, she recently opened up about the stabbings. Even though the Slenderman was once the scariest thing to her friends, her friends became the scariest thing to her after the stabbing. She had never felt such a deep sense of betrayal at such an early age, but she has slowly learned to recover. She has friends again, but she keeps them at a safe distance. And when she thinks of her wounds, she says that her scars are just another part of her now, and hopefully they'll fade with time. As of 2022, she said the attack inspired her to go into the medical field, and she is now in med school. And after everything, she said that even if she ever met Morgan face to face again, she would thank her. After what happened, Peyton now believes she has a sense of direction and a purpose in life to help others. Through her trauma and betrayal, she's learned to stay positive and move on. Go Peyton. That's the best possible outcome, I think, from yeah. this, this scenario. I agree. Is to turn such a negative experience into positive and inspire hope and, and change in your life and ultimately go on to help others. I love that. For many people, Slender Man is just a scary meme that's fun to Photoshop into pictures, make creepy fan art or internet fan fiction stories to pass around to each other. But for Morgan and Anissa, Slender Man wasn't just a hobby. He was a ghoul that haunted their nightmares and manipulated the way they thought. He was a creature who threatened to kill their families. And ultimately, this is a story of two girls who struggled with separating fiction from reality. So many things to take away from, from this case. It's hard to even know where to start. I know we were just talking before we started this podcast on a, a little off mic. We were talking about internet access, especially with mm -hmm. children. Internet literacy is, is big. Um, how do we monitor that? How do we successfully teach younger children um, 
how to use the internet. Yeah. It's a huge, scary place, right? I think also, ed- I mean, yeah, educating your children is the number one thing you can do and talking to them and also knowing what your children are doing online. It's yeah. it's very hard and I know it's a daunting task. And as a parent myself, I'm I'm already starting to research what tools are out there. And I mean, for me, it doesn't feel like such a hard thing to do and overcome because I do have a tech background. I'm pretty, you know, I was a essentially an ethical hacker for, for a little while. So I, <laughs> I know, I know my way around the internet and tools and I know how to, you know, know about spyware and there's plenty of things that you can do to kind of monitor your kids usage. And is that what you're doing on my work computer? Surprise. <laughs> I, I monitor everybody's work computers. No, not on not on that level. Well, you maybe. But, yeah, you should be. Yeah, yeah, I should be. I will after this. <laughs> but I think it really comes down to like, as a parent, your job is to know what your kids are doing, especially what they're doing online. And and because your phone, your computer is essentially an extension of yourself at this point. I mean, we're we're so close to the singularity where we merge with with technology and machine in, in a way that there is no separation from it anymore. It's, you know, the day that it's embedded into our skin and and to our eyeballs. I mean, that's going to create a whole nother issue, but this isn't a problem that's going away. It's a problem that's going to get worse and worse and worse. And I hope that more and more tools come out and there's ways to combat this because I think most of the issues that, that happen, especially with, with young children stem from their internet usage. And it's so easy to be, manipulated online it's so easy to be taken advantage of by others online i mean it's the internet is a is a wonderful thing but it's also created a world where people can be anonymous and pretend to be somebody that they're not and it's very easy to become trusting of somebody online and be manipulated into thinking that something is real when it's not and just with where technology is going and and the technology around deep fakes is very concerning and images and video are only going to become more and more convincing to us and there's going to be a point where we're not able to separate what's computer generated and what is real and that's what truly terrifies me because at that point what do you do if fake videos look the same as real videos i mean some of these slenderman videos to a young child i could see how they would believe that this is legit footage this is found footage of somebody's encounter with slenderman yeah and like you were saying like who to trust because you don't know who's on the other hand and behind certain things but in this case it's it's that you're trusting that these stories are real like fiction is real right so we even have a problem with just trusting what is fact which i guess is not anything new to the internet right the whole concept of uh fake news misinformation things like that so we can actually see how it's tangibly affecting kids now also i just want to note this is a this is really highly specific to this case as well because morgan had a mental illness so it's kind of all those problems with the internet are now are amplified yeah because of that exactly she's already dealing with the the delusions that this disorder this disease causes and then so, on top of that, the internet is now it's yes. going to get multiplied, yes. like you said. Mm-hmm. So, I think the only thing in that scenario you can do is like, and her parents. I mean, they claim to have been very involved. They're like, how much more involved could I have been if I'm not watching every single move that she makes? And I, and I think that's true to some extent. I do think that as a parent, especially when your kids are are minors, you have ultimately the responsibility of what they do online and what what content they're consuming falls back on you and if you do give them ipads and stuff like i'm just surprised that they didn't do anything after all the you know the dolls and the sketches and things like that like look through your kids stuff and there's this whole conversation around like does your child have privacy like how much privacy should your child have and i think privacy is important and your child should have some privacy, but at the same time, when it comes to the internet, yes. that's where I draw the line. Yeah, it's like in, in all other parts of life, 
Like, I don't want to be the parent that's like reading all my kids' text yeah, messages. Helicopter parent. Like, yeah, you don't like, want to be like totally overbearing like because that yeah. also leads to issues that leads to your child rebelling against you and, and yeah. potentially doing worse things yeah. as a result of that. So it's like, it's, it's very difficult and I'm not looking forward to that because I can already sense myself being like an overprotective person Yeah, and not a, not a hover child because I know what that's like, but but knowing more than I should and potentially running across things that I want to bring up with my daughter that I don't, you know, don't because that could damage the relationship that we have. Yeah. And also the trust that she yes. has in me. And that's, gonna that's the that hard up. part is like, but I think it's also at the very least being aware of what's going on and then being creative with how you go about dealing with it. And like, if your kid is diving into seemingly only dark content all the time and it's getting darker and darker and you're seeing that progression being made i feel it's your job as a parent to be like to sit them down and at least talk talk through like why you know kind of play therapist a little bit and then actually like bring them to a, a therapist and, and try to seek out counseling or something like that with a third party who might be able to get more information and then potentially diagnose them with some of these disorders that they had earlier on where it can be nipped in the butt so to speak and actually be treated before things sort of spiral out of control and i think that that's the challenge that their their parents ran into is they didn't know what what point to get involved or maybe they were busy and just didn't weren't able to have that time to to talk to them and so things just spiraled out of control but i do think parents ultimately have a lot of the responsibility here especially in this case like they should have been at least at least talking to their kids about what they were looking at instead of just like brushing it off because i think i do believe personally that it, you go down that dark path the dark path only gets darker and as you get older and i know from personal experience based on you know through movies and media that i've consumed it's like you do become desensitized to dark dark things and then you want to see something darker and then <laughs> something darker and then couple that with disorders or schizophrenia especially or any other sort of mental illness there's always a possibility of that getting amplified even further than just somebody who doesn't have you know anything working against them necessarily mentally i just think that is a that is a a very difficult path to come back from at some point i think it was i can't remember i think it was anisa in this case um she had posted something like a a rat or a mouse mm. um, being eaten by something yeah. or like some animals attacking each other. And I think she posted that possibly on her Facebook page. And to me, that would be obviously everything's, you know, 2020 in hindsight, but that seems to be a pretty red flag for a child to be posting something like that. And yeah, I mean, that is just, is it just you know, curiosity though? Is it like yeah. And it's like the same thing. You watch a nature documentary, you'll come across animals attacking other animals. So it's like, I think it's just in hindsight that those things are more clear, but I also think um, trust seems to be a, a central theme in this case. And like you brought that up, especially with monitoring kids, uh, whatever. Now, I think we both agree that being a tyrant with your kid's internet usage is really good. But yeah, you do have to find that fine line because if my parents were just going through my text messages or something when I was you know, a, a preteen. I think I got my phone when I was 12 and uh, yeah, my parents were just going through all my text messages. That would certainly break trust. So I think it's a very fine line um, to weave between the relationship yeah, of parents and their kids. I think the other thing too is that there's no rating system for the internet. Right, yeah. Like growing, True. when we were growing up, a movie Films, was rated yeah, R. Right. Yeah. It's rated R. You can't get in. You can't see it. There's no mm -hmm. other way to see it other than going to the movie theater. Or getting or my older it, brother to go rent it. <laughs> yeah, until it was released. And, but to rent it even, you would yeah. need an older person. Like you couldn't get, it was much harder to get access to content above your age level. And there was a whole reason that the, the that rating system was created, right? Mm -hmm. There's rated G, general audiences, PG, parental guidance, PG-13, you know, content that may not be suitable for children under the age of 13. And so you think they're 12 years old and they're consuming rated R content yep. at, at 12 years old. And I think that really plays into it. Cause I just don't think at that age, you're, you're 
mature enough, your brain is developed enough to really be able to handle the seriousness of of that content and and truly wrap your mind around the the reality of it and the the consequences of those actions and things like that. It's it's it just becomes this kind of like you're fascinated, sure, you're curious, sure, but you're not able to fully understand the ramifications of of what that content is, what what it does to you psychologically and and ultimately how it affects the people which it is about especially yeah. the violent content right yes especially i mean rated r is what 17 and older or 18 yeah. and older i think 17 17 yeah. and older so i saw it as like a rite of passage when my parents allowed me i think one of my first r-rated movies was saving private ryan and i think i was maybe 13 or 14 but i remember feeling sick to my stomach because that that's a very brutal movie um but I, or like the matrix was one of the first like mm. kind of more adult movies that i could see but yeah i was i felt like i was breaking new ground like i was like my parents finally see me mature enough to access something like this and my internet i don't know about your internet usage growing up my internet usage we had the it was like the aol family version aol like it, what is aol it? what is kol kids online oh kids yeah. On, yeah, oh yeah, yeah that's what yeah. it was called yeah so it had its own own like program like exactly web browser to access yep and, and it was, would monitor it would send emails to your parents yep with all the sites that you visited and it had like parental blocks exactly. that's something i do believe in though that's what i was on until parental i was like blocks. 12 yeah like it's so and that's that's like number one step and obviously your kid will probably go elsewhere there's wi-fi everywhere and there there's they will probably figure out a way to do well, it I, I, once i found out i could just download mozilla and go to that i was like okay well i'm just gonna bypass but like AOL. now like on pretty much every every router that you buy now you know whatever is putting out your wi-fi you can set up your firewall to block content and yeah. block specific websites and things like that so that's like what i plan to do is oh yeah have parental blocks on just a category as a whole and then also it pings you if anybody tries to visit that I should do that for here at the office because <laughs> I would love to see. I know I've seen Danny on some weird shit, but like the, I think technology can be used to to combat some of these issues. And I just think a lot of parents a don't want to fool around with it, or b don't know how to do it, and so ultimately they just don't do anything. They give their kids free range access to everything, and I think that's where you run into issues. Because I want to, I wouldn't want my twelve year old kid to be on creepy pasta. Like, no, nah. that's just. There's Especially dark, in, dark in, shit on in there. In that era, too, it was like, I remember the whole appeal of Creepypasta was to make it seem real. Yeah. That was, everyone was just trying to make it feel as real as possible. And up each other. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's kind of this competition to like, who creates the creepiest content? And then the mm -hmm. images that, like those images are terrifying no, images. They are. They These, scare me even as an adult. Yeah, like yeah. I'm, I don't even like to go on there because like <laughs> some of the images I run across, I'm like, what the fuck is this? Yeah. This is terrifying. And to think that 12 year olds are on there consuming it day and night and obsessing over it and then also believing that it's real is just is a is just a recipe for disaster yeah so is there a simple solution to this no but i do think education awareness and also using the tools at your disposal so many parents don't use the tools that all of the phones and apps and everything else have built-in parental controls but parents just don't spend the time to do it and they don't or they think that it's going to negatively affect the relationship on their kids. And, I, and I'm thankful for doing what, what we do because it, I have so much knowledge around this subject and I have so much, so many things I plan to share with my child and, and help them understand from a young age and educate them as early on of like, Hey, this is why you don't want to go there. This is there. This is the, I think the biggest thing is telling your kids you can't do something and then not explaining to them why. Yeah. And then they're like, why aren't you, why can't I go there? And they don't understand because yes, kids are smarter than you think. And I think too many parents treat their kids like they're dumb or they don't. I mean, they were 12 years old. Anissa and Morgan are 12 years old. They seem fairly mature to me. And like, if you actually sat down and explained to them like, Hey, Hey guys, like this is, this is fiction and showed them like got on the computer and did those Google searches of Jeff, the killer. And we're like, you see this how this doesn't real. like go yeah. to anywhere. Like this is mm -hmm. made up and, and spent that time to really like kind of, not not just shoot down their delusions but actually kind of like prove to them that their delusions are are exactly that 
that maybe we might have had a different outcome there. It intervened a little bit more. There wasn't enough intervention that happened from the parental side. And I'm not saying this to shame the parents because it's every what a, one thing I have learned as a parent is that you you have no right to shame any other parent for how they parent their kids because everybody's different. Everybody's got a different experience. And so by no means am I doing that. I'm just saying from my if this were me in my shoes, I would have tried to intervene in some way and try to educate them on I also think it's a gen- it might be a generational thing with you totally. because you know yes. like we grew up with the internet and access to it where maybe you know Anissa's and Morgan's parents they were a bit older so they just didn't really maybe just they didn't understand what could ha- what could go wrong and obviously this is like basically worst case scenario you would never yeah. think that even even of all the disturbing content on the internet having it actually manifest into a, a physical problem is is another thing as well so yeah maybe it was just a generational thing they didn't really understand i don't know i could give them the benefit of the doubt on that one yeah and i mean thank god this one turned out with a positive ending to it and she survived i mean to be stabbed that many times and and not die is honestly a miracle incredible and to crawl and to survive she just went into survival mode and i mean tough and I really was in med girl. school. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the best case scenario. Badass, here. like yeah. just big, big kudos to to Peyton for for making it out of that situation, surviving and going on to to now help people is is truly amazing. So, so yeah, I mean, we could go. I could go on and on about this all day. There's so many things to to talk about, but we're gonna go ahead and wrap up things there. Let us know your thoughts on this. Do you think the the punishments were were just? Do you think they should have been tried in juvenile court. Definitely want to hear your your opinions as usual. Let us know in the comments if you're watching on YouTube, if you're on Spotify or any other platforms. Join us on YouTube. Um, YouTube is now becoming our favorite place to hang out with you guys and for those of you to consume the podcast. But otherwise, join us on social media, Lights Out Casts, Instagram, TikTok, and Facebook. But we'll see you guys next time. Until then, lights out, everybody. <laughs>